Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Odem, and today we'll see how to improvise polyphony in four voices according to Tomas de Santa Maria. In another episode, we looked at Tomas de Santa Maria's interesting approach to consonances. If you haven't watched it, do check it out, as it contains basic things that are necessary to understand before proceeding. In this episode, we will touch on the core of his enormous treatise, how to play fantasia, how to improvise imitative polyphonic pieces in four voices on the keyboard. If you are brave, join me. Let's start. At around the middle of the second book of Tomas de Santa Maria's The Art of Playing the Fantasia, he arrives at the main goal of his entire treatise. The first chapter that deals with it is entitled Del Modo de Taniera Concierto, the way of playing several voices together, or in other words, playing polyphony. He writes that all that has been treated in this book has been ordered and directed as means to a single end, which is the art of playing polyphony. He continues to explain that whoever wishes to play according to the art of polyphony must imagine and assume that the four voices are four men of reason, among whom each individual one speaks when he should speak, is silent when he should be silent, and answers when he should answer, each one governing himself with regard for the others and in conformity to reason. Leaving this beautiful metaphor aside and coming down to the practical level, he notes that, for greater perfection in the music, it is essential that the melodic line of each individual voice be pleasing and correct in movement. Apart from these general directions, the way that Santa Maria's fantasias actually work is by having a subject, a short melody that is then imitated by the other voices in turns. This he calls in Spanish fuga, to escape or to flee, as if the first voice flees from the second voice, which then flees from the third one, and so on. When voices are not playing the subject, they may accompany it with free counterpoint, or alternatively sit out for a bit, like men of reason who know when to remain silent. This whole procedure, according to Santa Maria, is a thing most exquisite and soothing to the ear. But how is it done? Instead of jumping into the deep end and trying to play in four voices, Santa Maria tells us that one may see four voice polyphony as a combination of two pairs of voices, two duos. Therefore, he writes that one of the most essential yet difficult tasks in music is learning how to play a duo with skill and art this being the main foundation to the art of playing in polyphonic style. A duo can be made in two ways, without imitations and with imitations. That which Santa Maria appreciated most was the kind with imitations, with fuga, and this is where he puts most of his focus. Once we have a certain melody, a second voice may be added after a short delay, imitating the first voice, a fourth, a fifth, or an octave above or below it. If the imitation continues on and on, it is what we call a canon. What Santa Maria does most, however, is to only imitate a short subject, a short melodic fragment, and then turns to free counterpoint. The imitation may enter at the end of the subject, like here, for example. The subject starts on the lower voice on D, and the imitation joins later, a fifth higher, on A. Another way for which Santa Maria showed great appreciation is that of having the imitation start immediately, so that the subject and its imitation are overlapping. Nowadays, many scholars call it stretto fuga, and it can be seen in this example. The subject starts on G, and the imitation follows immediately a fourth lower.
Notice how both voices continue playing something following the statement of the subject, always going on, flowing effortlessly according to the rules of counterpoint, just like men of reason. Such an overlapping close imitation can work only if the subject is constructed in a certain way. How is it done? We didn't say it, but it is assumed that it is clear that an imitation works only when it is correct, that is, that the consequence of the two voices conform to the rules of counterpoint. Santa Maria describes how one may test whether a certain subject can work in close imitation or not. Once you have a subject, there are basically two factors that control the imitation, the pitch interval and the time interval. For example, in the case of this simple ascending subject, we will set the interval to a fourth above and the time interval to one half note. And we made ourselves a working close imitation. Let's now try to have the imitation a fourth below the subject. Hmm, this doesn't work. Let's try to delay it by another half note. Now it works. Santa Maria focused on stepwise ascending and descending subjects and disclosed the necessary parameters for them to work. Notice that the examples are presented in pairs which are mirror inversions of each other. This detail may facilitate memorization for the reader. Now, Unlike this summarized version, for every option Santa Maria gives a full musical example. After all, these are just models. In order to become real duos, they need to proceed nicely and end with a cadence. After this, Santa Maria discusses what kind of leaps a subject may have in what kind of imitations. For example, for an imitation at a fifth above that is delayed by one note to work, the subject can only ascend by a third or a fifth or descend by a second or a fourth. The other intervals will be dissonant. For an imitation at the fifth below to work, you need only to reverse the direction of the intervals. That is, the subject may only descend a third or a fifth or ascend by a second or a fourth. Now that you see more or less how imitations work, we can go on. We need to see how one can create four voice polyphony by combining two duos. Santa Maria's four voice model is based on two duos that answer one another. One duo starts with the subject and its imitation, and then comes the second duo. This dialogue may continue either by using the same subject or by introducing new subjects. Finally, the piece will be concluded with a cadence with all the voices together. As we said before, when a voice is not playing the subject, it may accompany the other voices with free counterpoint. In that way, the texture may vary from one voice at the beginning, four voice at the end, and varying textures during the course of the piece. In this example, we see how the bass and tenor duo is followed by the alto and canto duo, and the other voices, once the subject is stated, are free to accompany or to rest. Notice. The second duo must enter in a way that agrees with the ending of the first duo. Here, for example, the notes at the end of the first duo are consonant with the notes at the beginning of the second duo, so there is no problem. But sometimes this is not the case, and one might need to create a graceful but not lengthy melodic extension that will bring it to pitches consonant to the voice or voices of the duo that follows. That which Santa Maria preferred most, however, was not only to arrive at notes which formed consonances, but to make a little cadence, overlapping with the entry. 
thereby making the entry feel smooth and flowing. It is hard to describe just how much effort Santa Maria took in order to describe every possible way different subjects can be rendered at different cadences. The factors that he took into consideration were 1. The nature of the subject 2. The different kinds of cadences on which these subjects can fit In fact, he had a rather interesting way of categorizing cadences. Check the footnotes for more details. 3. The different points during the cadence that the subject can enter on. And 4. Whether the second duo is above the first duo or below it. Variation in each of the factors leads to different results. And Santa Maria did not spare any ink showing that. Just to give you a taste, here is how he demonstrates the merging point between two duos, where the subject is in ascending stepwise motion. The second duo is above the first one. The entry takes place one minimum before what Santa Maria called the cadential semibrieve, and it is demonstrated with four different kinds of cadences. In the first example, the simple subject starts in the bass on C and is imitated by the tenor a fifth above on G. In order to reach the desired kind of cadence, a little bridge is added. The soprano entrance takes place during the cadence on G, and a further cadence, this time in C, takes place at the corresponding moment in the alto imitation. After that, a concluding cadence brings the example to a close. Let's listen. The next examples show how the same subject can enter during three further kinds of cadences. The first one has an interval of a second between the two lowest voices, but the next one has a fourth. The one after has a fifth. and the last one has a seventh. From a modern point of view, one might wonder if it was not better to condense this information, only showing how such a subject can be fitted into the different cadence models. Santa Maria, however, rarely condenses information. He only shows musical phenomena in a musical context. Notice also that as opposed to the neat modern notation that I used here, the original examples are not in tabulated and are not even in score format. For each example, the four different parts, which are without bar lines, are simply printed above one another. This might have been a pedagogical choice, but also a necessary compromise due to printing limitations. Regardless, Without intabulating the examples, it is not really possible to sight-read them. Even if there were some people back then that could do that, it leaves us, modern readers, behind. And intabulating every example can take a lot of time and might prove a hindrance to the understanding of the specific points he wants to convey. In his defense, it should be said that the examples are all well-made and always very musical. If someone were to go through the trouble of intabulating all the examples, even if he misses a lot of the sometimes tiring explanations, he will surely learn a lot. After an impossible number of examples and technical descriptions, Santa Maria finally arrives at the end of his treatise and demonstrates how to combine in a longer piece a series of several subjects. I remind you, this enormous book was not about how to play such pieces, not even how to compose them, but about how to improvise such pieces on the spot. So even if this final piece is not especially exciting, although still quite beautiful, the tools one may learn while trying to reach such a high level of contrapuntal improvisation 
are very impressive. When listening, notice how the subjects, imitations, and cadences are always overlapping, flowing smoothly from one to the other. A modern reader might suggest that Santa Maria tried to make a science out of an art, and that it perhaps was sometimes not necessarily helpful. But true learning takes place on several parallel paths, and those who will follow Santa Maria and examine and play his examples will without doubt learn a lot, perhaps even be able to improvise in four parts. This was our show for today, we hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.